I understand that one major concern of yours in running a successful company, especially in the current economic climate, is the question of worker loyalty. Are you saying that such a thing no longer exists? And if so, what are some of the reasons for this? And how important is loyalty to the smooth and successful running of a company such as yours? Well. I do think it's important, but I also realise that we can't go back to the old-fashioned sense of loyalty, where an employee would spend his whole working life with one company or business.、Mm -hmm. Our grandparents, even our parents' generation, expected long-term employment, and their loyalty was rewarded with health care and a pension. This is no longer the case. Many companies are no longer willing, or perhaps even able, to provide such a financial package. Besides, to a younger generation, sticking at the same job all your life isn't a very exciting or inspiring prospect.、Mm. Some reasons for this might be the shortening of contracts, outsourcing, automation, and people holding down more than one job. In other words, we've all had to adapt to the realities of a rapidly changing, fast-paced economy. However, all this is not to say that loyalty is dead; rather, it has changed emphasis. Today, it is more about trust. In that an employee will promise to bring his skills and engage fully in his work for as long as she or he is there. People change jobs a lot more these days, but I still believe that a company is better off with at least a core of people who stay for the long term.
Within most developed countries, notions of pragmatism, notions of the fact that we have democracies, have succeeded in tempering the market economy. In the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution has a very negative effect on people, particularly working classes all over the world. We see data where life expectancy was reduced, hikes we were reduced, we were looking at the medical record. We can see that actually, living standards, much among large fractions of the population, actually went down. But eventually, we passed the legislation about working conditions. And we circumscribed some of the worst kinds of behavior. We eventually, in the 20th century, we put regulations that composed better environmental conditions. And so some of the damage was reversed, and that we have made the market economy work, and ways that the benefit of the all is far more what we shared in the world a hundred years ago.
Listen to part of a lecture in a psychology class. The professor is talking about stating laws in the science of psychology. Psychology is a relatively new science. Like other sciences, psychology must be able to state laws. A law is a way of organizing knowledge about something so that we can make predictions. When enough knowledge is gained about a subject, a scientist can state precisely what will happen under certain conditions. We experimental psychologists are interested in developing laws about human behavior, so we'll be able to understand and predict what people do and why they do it. Of course, to develop laws about human behavior, we must assume there's some regularity to it. We can't be psychologists without making the assumption that behavior follows certain patterns. One of the major laws psychologists have discovered is called the law of effect. The law of effect states that whether or not a person will repeat a behavior depends on the effect that behavior has. If an action is rewarded, it's likely to be repeated. If the action is not rewarded or if it's punished, it's not likely to be repeated. How do psychologists state laws? First, using available knowledge, a psychologist makes a hypothesis about behavior. Then, the psychologist tests the hypothesis through an experiment. But even if the experiment proves the hypothesis, Land animals move easily through air because air does not slow them down. Sea creatures, on the other hand, have to move through water, which is hundreds of times thicker than air. A sea animal has to push itself through water in order to move. Sea animals use many different ways to swim, creep, or glide through water. Fish are able to swim by bending their bodies into waves. They have flattened fins and tails that push against the water like oar blades, converting their body waves into forward movement. The size of a fish's tail contributes to its swimming speed. Small tail fins are found in slow swimmers like the eel. The medium-sized tail of the bass is linked with a medium to fast swimming speed. Long pointed tail lobes like those on the marlin are found only on fast swimmers. Sea mammals like whales and dolphins swim in a very fish-like way, except for one important difference. Because their ancestors lived on the land, they developed tails that moved up and down. Whales and dolphins wave their tails up and down, rather than side to side like fish do. The seahorse is a fish whose tail is not used for swimming at all. The seahorse uses its thin, coiled tail to attach itself to seaweed, like a monkey's tail holds onto a tree branch. Squids and octopuses move in a completely different way. They use a type of jet propulsion, shooting water out. The complex process inside a leaf takes energy from the sun and uses it to convert water and carbon dioxide into sugars. During this process, photosynthesis, plants convert light energy into chemical energy. All leaves carry out photosynthesis in basically the same way. First, the pores on the leaf's outer skin open up and take in molecules of carbon dioxide. Water absorbed by the roots is transported upward through the plant and it enters the leaf through its stem. Carbon dioxide and water, these are the raw materials for photosynthesis. Once carbon dioxide and water are present, photosynthesis can begin. The chemical reactions of photosynthesis take place in two stages, the light-dependent reactions and the light-independent reactions. When sunlight shines on a leaf during the light-dependent stage, its energy is absorbed by molecules of chlorophyll, which you all know is the pigment giving a leaf its green color. 
The light energy absorbed by the chlorophyll is used to split the hydrogen and oxygen in the water. Then, during the light independent reactions, hydrogen from the water combines with carbon dioxide and forms carbohydrates, including the sugar glucose, but also other molecules that are rich in food energy for the plant. In the process, excess oxygen is released to the outside air through the leaf's pores. Finally, the plant transports the products of photosynthesis. Microscopic veins in the leaf carry the food out through the stem and into the cells of the plant. This process continues all throughout the growing season, that is, as long as the leaves remain green. Avalanches are a constant threat on mountain highways. The Rogers Pass stretch of the Trans-Canada is at risk of being buried in snow from November to April every year. This is why the highway now has a sophisticated defense system. The best way, uh, it's important to control an avalanche when it's small, so a slide is set off while it's still small before it builds up into a serious danger. A team of snow technicians monitors the snowpack. They sort of read the snow and try to predict when it's likely to slide. They study data from the weather stations in the mountains. As the danger increases, they drop explosives onto test slopes to see if the snow can be made to slide. It's kind of tricky trying to decide just when the snow will slide. The weight of the snow, together with the force of gravity, is what starts an avalanche. The technicians don't want to wait till it's too late, but if they're too early, before conditions are just right, the snow won't release. When the time is right, they close the road and remove all traffic from the pass. Most closures last two to four hours. Then the Army comes in. A 10-man artillery crew operates a mobile 105-millimeter howitzer, firing shells into the slopes. This sends out shock waves that trigger the avalanches. Slides are set off one by one. The technicians direct the action, telling the troops where to aim the gun. Visibility can be awful. Then they have to check and see if the avalanche has released well enough. Sometimes they drive their trucks below the slide path, kind of dangerous work, and they listen to the snow come down. Sometimes, if the slide is bigger than they expected, they might have to make a speedy getaway. Number Various species of Pacific salmon make a round trip from the small streams where they are born to the sea and then back to the stream of their origin where they spawn and die. This round trip is known as the salmon's run. The end of the salmon's run is the beginning of the next generation. Pacific salmon hatch in the headwaters of a stream. As fry, the fish then migrate downstream via rivers and eventually to the ocean where they require several years to mature. While in the sea, salmon from many river systems school and feed together. When mature, the salmon form into groups of common geographic origin and migrate back toward the river they emerged from as juveniles. Is it true that they find their way home by their sense of smell? During the first stage of their return, they navigate by the position of the sun. But later, when they reach the river leading to their home stream, their keen sense of smell takes over. Just what is it they can smell? The other fish? The water flowing from each stream carries a unique scent. This scent comes from the types of plants, soil, and other components of that stream. This scent is apparently imprinted in the memory of a salmon fry before it migrates to the sea. I remember having a real shock when I was hiking once. I was looking at a waterfall, 
and I saw a salmon jump up, about ten feet. At first I couldn't believe my eyes, but then I saw another one do it, and then several more. It was an awesome sight. They must have an incredibly powerful instinct. The survival of their species depends on their ability to get home and reproduce. And of course, other species depend on the survival of the salmon. Salmon provide an important link in the food chain. They spend 90% of their lives in the ocean where they feed on plankton, shrimp, and small fish. When they make their return journey, they carry nutrients from the ocean back to the rivers and streams. Up north, where I used to live in the river valley, the eagles would gather for the salmon run every year. They'd gorge themselves on all the salmon that had just spawned. Nothing is wasted in nature. After the salmon spawn, their carcasses feed birds, mammals, and vegetation, and even their own newly hatched offspring. Numbers and diagrams are highly abstract and condensed summaries of the world. They require a degree of mental effort to bridge the gap between them and the aspects of the real world they stand for. Approach them slowly and with care, allowing yourself time to get the feel of what you are looking at. Don't assume you already know what you are looking at. It's easy to be distracted by the surface appearance of a diagram, but we are really interested in the underlying message. If sea levels continue to rise, eventually the property becomes inundated and the real value of the property, the vast bulk of its value will be in the value of the land which of course is then unusable. And that's of course not insured by property insurance. So at that point a lot of waterfront landowners and banks and other financial institutions that have lent money against the value of those properties are going to find that they suffer very serious losses and it's not at all obvious at the moment who would compensate them. And one particular crop, almonds in the US and now in Australia, is transforming the world of beekeeping and of bees. What has happened is that something serendipitous came along that people found out, that doctors found out that almonds are good for you, they are actually a food that is normally considered a confection, but it's good for you. The almond board got a very aggressive promotion going on for almonds. I just heard recently, they send out sales reps to cardiologists at hospitals to promote the heart benefits of almonds, so they go right to the doctors to do this. 
so they leave no stone unturned in a very good promotion of almonds, and it's legitimate promotion because they are a healthy food. So what's happened is worldwide. Almond sales have taken off. Certainly I do think that by the end of this decade, the largest social institution in Australia will be single-person households, so that the family, mum, dad and the kids is receiving in terms of market share. So less than 28% of households are now mum, dad and the kids, whereas by the end of the decade you'll see that 29% of households are single-person households. Now the issue with single-person households is that people are looking for companionship and as a consequence people living singly will include increasingly pets as their companions. So you could see in Australia in the next decade where the fur family, the pet family, actually becomes the dominant social institution in Australia rather than the human family. In the early days of the settlement of Australia, enterprising settlers unwisely introduced the European rabbit. This rabbit had no natural enemies in the Antipodes, so that it multiplied with that promiscuous, abandoned characteristic of rabbits. It overran a whole continent. It caused devastation by burrowing and by devouring the herbage which might have maintained millions of sheep and cattle. Scientists discovered that this particular variety of rabbit, and apparently no other animal, was susceptible to a fatal virus disease, myxomatosis. By infecting animals and letting them loose in the burrows, local epidemics of this disease could be created. Later it was found that there was a type of mosquito which acted as the carrier of this disease and passed it on to the rabbits. So while the rest of the world was trying to get rid of mosquitoes, Australia was encouraging this one. It effectively spread the disease all over the continent and drastically reduced the rabbit population. 
It later became apparent that rabbits were developing a degree of resistance to this disease, so that the rabbit population was unlikely to be completely exterminated. There were hopes, however, that the problem of the rabbit would become... The adolescent, with his passion for sincerity, always respects a parent who admits that he is wrong or ignorant, or even that he has been unfair or unjust. What the child cannot forgive is the parent's refusal to admit these charges if the child knows them to be true. Victorian parents believed that they kept their dignity by retreating behind an unreasoning authoritarian attitude. In fact, they did nothing of the kind, but children were then too cowed to let them know how they really felt. Today, we tend to go to the other extreme. But on the whole, this is a healthier attitude both for the child and the parent. It is always wiser and safer to face up... People are always talking about the problem of youth. If there is one, which I take leave to doubt, then it is older people who create it, not the young themselves. Let us get down to fundamentals and agree that the young are, after all, human beings, people just like their elders. There is only one difference between an old man and a young one. The young man has a glorious future before him, and the old one has a splendid future behind him. And maybe that is where the rub is. When I was a teenager, I felt that I was just young and uncertain, that I was a new boy in a huge school, and I would have been very pleased to be regarded as something so interesting as a problem. For one thing, being a problem gives you a certain identity. And that is one of the things the young are busily engaged in. Atmospheric pressure can support a column of water up to 10 meters high, but plants can move water much higher. The sequoia tree can pump water to its very top more than 100 meters above the ground. Until the end of the 19th century, the movement of water in trees and other tall plants was a mystery. Some botanists hypothesized that the living cells of plants acted as palms. But many experiments demonstrated that the stems of plants in which all the cells are killed can still move water to appreciable heights. Other explanations for the movement of water in plants have been based on root pressure, a push on the water from the roots at the bottom of the plant. But root pressure is not nearly great enough to push water to the tops of tall trees. Furthermore, the conifers, which are among the tallest trees, have unusually low root
There are hot peppers like the jalapeno, and then there are incendiary peppers like the legendary habanero. Now there's a new variety of thermonuclear habanero known as the Tiger Paw NR habanero. The name comes from its appearance. The bright orange pepper resembles a tiger's paw, and the NR stands for nematode resistant. The pepper was bred by U.S. Department of Agriculture scientists to be resistant to nematodes, roundworms that attack the plant's roots. The pepper was bred conventionally, not genetically engineered, and it does away with the need to use the soil fumigant methyl bromide, which is being phased out. So how hot is the tiger paw habanero? Pepper hotness is measured on something called the Scoville heat scale. A jalapeno comes in at about 5,000 on the Scoville scale. A regular habanero usually scores at least 100,000. And the tiger paw habanero tops the Scoville scale at almost 350,000. In fact, there's a legend that eating habanero peppers can have the side effect of actually making you deaf, but only so that you cannot hear your own screams. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Steve Mursky. Got a minute? The Nobel Prize in Chemistry goes to three men who revolutionized molecular life science, Japan's Osama Shimomura and Americans Martin Chalfi and Roger Tsen. They developed tools to light up and see individual proteins inside living cells. These tiny molecular flashlights make it possible to study numerous events that take place in cells and whole organisms that were previously invisible, such as the development of nerve cells or the spread of cancer cells. In 1962, Shimomura, now Emeritus Professor at the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole, discovered that jellyfish produce a green fluorescent protein, GFP, that glows when exposed to ultraviolet light. Some 30 years later, Columbia University's Chalfi showed that the GFP gene could be put into any organism. By making sure the fluorescent protein was expressed at the same time as other proteins of interest, researchers could literally light up events they want to follow. Then Sen at the University of California, San Diego, engineered fluorescent proteins in various colors. The multicolor palette enables researchers to follow multiple biological processes at the same time. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. Practical experiments are an essential part of the chemistry course. You must call your doctor to make an appointment. The large, wide table is not for sale.
close the door behind you when you leave the room. There are accounting assignments for finance students. Foods containing overabundant calories supply little or no nutritional value. We have a lecture in the morning of Thursday. You should submit your essay next semester. Some vocational courses in institutions are funded by private enterprises.